There's a world apart, a place in your heart, can't you hear it calling you? Summer never ends. Mayday! 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 This is Dispatch Master Tra Transport! 4019er! Mayday! Mayday, please acknowledge! Disaster transport. It'll take you out of this world, but it may not get you back. New this summer at Cedar Point. Can you read me? Oh, yeah! Hello. My name is Kevin Perger, and welcome to another edition in Defunctland. For background slash context on this series, please visit defunctland.com with the link below. Today, we will be attempting to resurrect the extinct indoor roller coaster, Disaster Transport. I decided to make this to appease all of these wonderful coaster fans. Get to the point. Get to the point. Lake Erie Cedar Point Peninsula, located in Sandusky, Ohio, first opened in 1870 as a recreation center for lake goers. The peninsula, named after its large population of cedar trees, was mainly used for fishing until 1870, when ferries began to shuttle people to Cedar Point, usually for picnics and other summer activities. Twelve years later, Cedar Point debuted its first roller coaster, the Switchback Railway. Twenty years after that, a second roller coaster was built, then a third in 1908, and a fourth in 1912, and more and more throughout the years until today, where they now call themselves the roller coaster capital of the world. But they weren't void of missteps, and this is the story of one of their most infamous. The year is 1985, Careless Whisperer by Wham is topping the charts, Back to the Future is about to be released in theaters, and Michael Eisner is taking a shot at running the Walt Disney Company. In Ohio, Cedar Point CEO Robert L. Munger Jr. has found the recipe for his park success. While previous administrations had attempted to copy Disney's successes in theming, Munger found that record-breaking and unique thrill rides best fit Cedar Point. The park was pumping out coasters as fast as possible. On May 11, 1985, one of these new coasters, Avalanche Run, opened at Cedar Point in the spot previously occupied by another coaster, Jumbo Jet. The Avalanche Run was a bobsled coaster, which meant that there were no rails, and the ride car would move freely down a tube propelled by gravity alone. With a build cost of $3.4 million, the coaster had a two and a half minute runtime, with the lift hill taking up over half of that. It reached a top speed of 40 miles per hour and a top height of 63 feet. The ride was cute, and a hit with families due to its gentle speed and quick turns. It had its issues though, mainly its location near the coast of Lake Erie, which allowed gusts of wind to blow large amounts of sand into the track. When this happened, it would have to be cleaned out, which was costly to maintenance and lost ridership. Just one year after the opening of Avalanche Run, in 1986, Munger stepped down as CEO of the newly organized Cedar Fair. Richard Dick Kinzel, who at the time was the general manager of Cedar Fair's only other park, Minnesota's Valley Fair, was appointed to CEO. His plans for the company were ambitious, and he would go on to acquire literally all of Cedar Fair's parks besides the original two in his long tenure. When he first took over, however, his focus was on Cedar Point. Kinzel had been keeping a close eye on Disney during his time at Valley Fair. And the year he took over Cedar Fair was the same year that Star Tours opened at Disneyland. Drawing huge audiences and media attention, Kinzel saw the benefits to theming attractions. If he could combine the intricate theming and story of Star Tours, and redress one of his already existing coasters as a Space Mountain type ride, perhaps he could push Cedar Point into a new direction, the Disneyland of the Midwest. The coaster to be redressed couldn't be too big for obvious cost and logistics reasons, and they just happened to have one that both fit these parameters and even needed the ride building to protect it from the loads of sand that kept blowing into its tubes. Cedar Point is now the most visited seasonal amusement park in the United States, and it, like many other seasonal parks, closes during the winter or longer. When Disney or Universal renovates a ride, there is a massive amount of attention on its progress. When Cedar Point or another seasonal park renovates a ride during the off-season, it just opens. It isn't there on closing day, and it is on opening day the next year. So when guests entered Cedar Point in 1990, Avalanche Run was gone, seemingly replaced by a new, enclosed attraction with the mysterious name Disaster Transport.
Next time you get bored with life on Earth, leave. Disaster Transport. New this summer at Cedar Point. The conversion costs an additional $4 million in building costs, theming, and the addition of two animatronics. The new building and special effects were made by ITEC Productions, a small company out of Orlando, Florida. The new ride building was awkwardly shaped, as it was trying to conform to the track of Avalanche Run. It prominently displayed 12E in large letters. Some thought that this stood for the 12th coaster that was built at Cedar Point, but Avalanche Run was the 7th, and Disaster Transport was the 9th. The actual origins came from an ITEC employee named Eric. Disaster Transport was the 12th ride that he had designed, hence the 12E. Guests flocked towards the new building, wondering what mysteries were waiting for them inside. Mysteries is exactly what they got, and they didn't get much else. Guests were confused at what exactly the story behind the ride was. This is what could be pieced together through the queue and ride experience. Guests entered the first room, nicknamed Mission Control. This completely blacklit section featured posters of vacation packages, a diagram of the ride vehicle, videos of space pilots talking about their trip, and an animatronic trying to sell you travel destinations. In future years, guests also had the option of buying a pair of Chroma Depth 3D glasses. These were used commonly in amusement parks and live attractions to enhance practical effects. After exiting Mission Control, guests entered a hallway with murals of cargo boxes and glowing handprints. With the Chroma Depth glasses, these appeared to stick out and move as guests walked by. Next was the biggest room of the queue line, the repair bay. This room featured industrial equipment, an overhanging basket with lost luggage and replacement parts, a robotic arm working on a rocket sled, a sci-fi generator, thing, and a security camera that would reject guests after observing them. At the exit of this area, there was a logo of the transport company featured on the wall, Dispatch Master Transport, but it was subtly broken to indicate the ride's actual name. Finally, the station was called the Launch Bay. New trains come from behind a curtain, eerily with no passengers in them. Guests board the train, then the lift hill. Just as slow and long as Avalanche Run, but now with flashing lights lining the sides. An audio clip of Mission Control would attempt to dispatch Master Transport, only for them to lose control, and guests would begin their descent. A projector displayed a brilliant star field, and as guests began to pick up speed, they would see a similar rocket to their own explode, with their sled moving to avoid the debris. Next, guests would fly past glowing planets, around a large spaceship, over the surface of Mars, and then it was over. Guests exit the bobsled in the show building and encounter a peculiar sign that reads, Welcome to Alaska. If you're confused, welcome to the club. This ride has basically two narratives. One is the Star Tours knockoff space transportation vacation story. I guess the funny part is that you go all the way to space just to end up in Alaska. The other is the cargo transportation story, in which something goes wrong, whether it be a malfunction or space pirates. Neither was fully realized and resulted in a weird, random space adventure. Some claim that there were more effects present on opening day than I just described, such as the voices heard being from the in-flight computer named Dave, while others think that Dave was the robot at the beginning. It is very difficult to back these claims with the lack of evidence and the fact that the ride opened 27 years ago, so it isn't fresh in anyone's memories. When the ride first opened, lines would reach upwards of 90 minutes. Cedar Point seemed to have successfully renovated Avalanche Run, but this was just the beginning of the true disaster. The attraction's animatronics and decorations immediately began to break down, but instead of fixing or replacing parts, Kinzel refused to have any work done. The most that was done was the removal of some of the effects, such as… Dave? Eventually, riders would find themselves in complete darkness, where there was once projections and lights. In 1997, a section of the queue line was removed to make room for Cedar Point's Halloween event, Halloween Weekends. As Kinzel's reign at Cedar Fair continued, and he began his long string of acquisitions of parks such as Knott's Berry Farm, Disaster Transport sat as an embarrassment to his original ambition for the parks. Cedar Fair was not Disney, and it would never again try to be. Disaster Transport was an embarrassment to the park, but instead of destroying it, Kinzel decided to milk it dry. This is when Cedar Point began selling the Chroma Depth 3D glasses for $1, as well as glow sticks and other toys in the ride's queue. If you remember the defunct line on Son of Beast, you know that in 2006, Kinzel and Cedar Fair acquired Paramount Parks. These parks had extensive theming using Paramount's licensed properties. Instead of re-theming the rides, Cedar Fair simply ripped off their labels, turning them into generic thrill rides, proving once again how much disaster transport scared Cedar Fair away from anything out of the ordinary. In 2009, another section of the queue was acquired for a Halloween weekend's haunted house. Happy Jack's Toy Factory, which moved the main entrance to an emergency exit leading directly into the repair bay. The multiple acquisitions and construction of new attractions during the recession put Cedar Fair in huge amounts of debt, 
Seeing that his tenure was almost over, Kinzel attempted to create a $20 million golden parachute for himself by selling the company and refinancing their debt. This failed, and on January 2, 2012, Matt Wiemet took over as the CEO of Cedar Fair. Wiemet was the former president of Disneyland, so he had some experience cleaning up after CEO's failures. But where is disaster transport? Six months after Wiemet took over, Cedar Point would close the attraction after 22 years of operation. The final dispatch event was held on July 29, 2012 raising money for charity. Soon after, both Disaster Transport and its neighbor Space Spiral came down. In its place came a new coaster, Gatekeeper, bringing the outdated and decaying entrance new life, as well as telling all those who entered that they were in the roller coaster kingdom. So why did Disaster Transport close? Besides, you know, duh. Disaster Transport had many unmentioned issues that added to its demise. Firstly, Avalanche Run itself had many mechanical problems with its air brake systems. These failures would cause sudden emergency stops and extensive downtime. Secondly, the ride building itself wasn't watertight. In the event of any rain, water would pool inside the track areas and would need to be shut down. Guests were not happy that an indoor attraction couldn't remain open during a slight downpour. But the main reason for its closure was the newly appointed Wiemet. His plans for bringing Cedar Point back to life included promoting the Lake Erie beachfront, turning the park into a summertime resort. Disaster Transport was an ugly, square, industrial building sitting on the edge of the beautiful beach so it made sense to destroy the ride. There is a tribute to Disaster Transport in Hallow Weekends, with one of the bobsleds filled with skeletons and the old exit sign. With every attraction, there comes a certain amount of nostalgia. Even the biggest disasters hold a place in the hearts of park goers. While the majority of guests might not miss Disaster Transport, there are a few that were devastated by its closure, and even today, yearn to go back on their trip to Alaska. Transport. Oh, yeah. We're on the transport.